I'm going to present here uh, some, uh, some work that uh, I and we've been doing, along with uh, Juan Pablo Beltran and Cesar, we've been doing um, in the last time. So, well, it's, well, I'm not sure whether you're going to like it, but uh, we did it. So, yeah, this is based on, uh, on a paper which is trying to explain or to give some framework to explain the, how one could generate the cold spot anomaly or something like this. And plus some other work, part of it in preparation, part of it in progress, and some other, some other work which is still in store. Let's see if it uh, comes out of the closet or not. We'll see. <laughs> 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 if it emerges, if it's, uh, you know, for the time being, this is just, uh, this is just in store. So, uh, on CMB anomalies, I, well, I don't think I'm going to elaborate just uh, remember Martin's discussion session, and uh, that's pretty much what uh, the introduction on CMB anomalies. So just remember that. Um, so, okay, I'm just going to explain the idea behind this mechanism. More than a mechanism to generate anomalies, it's, uh, I might understand it as a framework, which may allow you or not to produce some anomalies. So it's not that I'm going to present something here that is going to predict the generation of all of the anomalies, but this, this is just a framework, something that one might consider, which might give rise to some of the anomalies, okay? Or not, but uh, this is just basically a framework. So, um, because an image is uh, worth 1,000 words, I believe that the, the easiest thing is uh, to just to explain the idea, which is very simple, okay, with, uh, with a couple of images. So, oh, well, no, first I'm going to present the question. Um, so this is the framework to understand uh, uh, CMB anomalies, and the question that uh, I was asking myself is, was how much do you need to twist the inflationary paradigm to obtain CMB anomalies? Do you have to twist it severely? Does it get distorted so badly that you wouldn't consider that seriously. So this is the question, how much do you, know, do, do you need to twist it to deviate from the simplest single slow roll inflation models that uh, work so well? So, well, and I'm going to consider just an ingredient, okay? The ingredient that I'm going to consider is uh, just a, an isoc curvature field, another scalar field, right? So apart from the inflaton, there is uh, this other scalar field that for some reason you have to provide the mechanism for the scalar field to do that, contributes to the curvature perturbation spectrum imprinted on the CMB. So I'm going just to consider an additional scalar field, right? That's an isocurvature perturbation. Perturbation. It, there is a B that should be there. So isocurvature perturbations can do really funny things. And uh, you see, for some time now, I've been displaying this picture. I'm going to display it again because I happen to like it so much. This is uh, what I saw in, by the field. This is an anomaly, but uh, constrained to Earth, right? So this is sort of an anomaly. You see this wheat field over there. And of course, you understand the moment you see this, that these two sunflowers are isolated. And you understand that this is not a weird fluctuation of the wheat. Obviously, it's not. This is something with a completely different origin. So this is just, this is just not a fluctuation. That's something else. That's something with a different origin. Okay? And uh, I suppose I happen to like this picture very much because uh, that was taken in Salamanca, which is uh, where I was born. And this is the countryside, uh, which is very picturesque. So I suppose that's why I like it so much. Good, so I'll keep, uh, you know, in future talks I'll be still producing, if anomalies are still over there, I'll keep producing this picture. So, the setup, how do you arrange things, your ingredients, how do you cook up the soup, basically? So, what I'm going to consider is that the inflation, uh, the inflaton is uh, responsible for most of the CMB perturbations, which then produces a homogeneous and isotropic uh, perturbation spectrum, and I'm going to require that the, the isocurvature field, for some reason that I'll explain later on, and I explain, I'll explain how to generate this initial condition so weird, uh, it's in an initially excited state, which happened not to fully relax 
by the end of inflation, right? So in the end of inflation, at the end of inflation, there is this initially excited state that is uh, somewhere, uh, well, the field didn't relax completely, so there are some patches in the universe in which you find the field in an excited state, still in a remnant of that excited state, and in some other parts, the field has completely relaxed and you don't see it. So the hope is that to produce an inhomogeneous distribution for the Isaacovitch field, right? So, and the expectation is the outcome is that this inhomogeneous distribution of the Isaacovitch field at the end of inflation, uh, if you provide some mechanism, will contribute to the curvature perturbation, breaking uh, statistical homogeneity of the CMB, maybe isotropy as well, and the hope is then to explore this or to test this framework or scenario to use it as an avenue to understand CMB anomalies. That's basically the idea. Okay? So now, um, an image is, uh, like I said before, one, worth 1,000 words. So to help the eye how this goes, I'm just going to produce a simulation of a fluctuating two dimensional scalar field. Okay, just to help the eye and to see how things uh, or what inflation does to scalar fields that are able to fluctuate during inflation. So imagine that we begin with the, this is the X and Y, this is basically your two dimensional space. This is, um, this is the field value, sigma, right? Which begins in a nearly homogeneous ex uh, excited state with a sigma large for some reason. Okay, it doesn't begin in zero, it begins at some uh, large value. Let me just say large without specifying for the time being how large is large. Right? So this is homogeneous. Our universe emerges from a nearly homogeneous patch because previous phases of inflation then homogenizes all the fields. So as inflation uh, unfolds, right, structure is being imprinted in this classical field configuration. So you have bumps appearing here and there. Okay. If you continue, well, this is the imprint of a structure in a um, uh, characteristic of inflation on smaller scales. And if you, as you continue, uh, as inflation continues, then you still imprint more and more structure on prog progressively smaller scales. So in the next defaulting, you would have something like this. And this gets uh, bumpier and bumpier as time goes by. And it looks really complicated when a number of defaults, a considerable number of defaults have elapsed. So, yeah, okay, imagine that then you have something like this, a, right, a landscape, sort of landscape, where you have correlations on this uh, classical field configuration, sigma xy. And, uh, you know, I'm going to consider just that this field sigma is uh, just the simplest thing that you can think of, which is uh, just a massive non-interacting field. So this field distribution, Okay, lives in a quadratic potential, and it evolves just uh, uh, towards the zero, right? So this would be traveling or moving towards the zero. Now imagine that for some reason you have a cutoff in field space, so that for some reason you can get rid of uh, the part of the field, the part of the landscape that lies below this region over there. So when the field configuration reaches this point, then there is this part, the, the remaining part would be a remnant of the out of equilibrium initially, out of equilibrium configuration. If you keep going during inflation, then more landscape disappears, okay? This is still the remnant of the out of equilibrium distribution, more inflation, the distribution continues evolving towards the zero, relaxing, so this is less abundant, these structures over here are less abundant, if you keep going and going and going, eventually the distribution disappears and the initially excited state is out of sight, it's, it's gone, okay? So the idea is that, uh, well, it might be tuned or not, depending on the parameters. I, the idea is to catch this field when inflation finishes halfway towards its fully relaxed state. So at the end of inflation, the idea is that you have this field, uh, this field in some parts, in most of the CMB or in most of the spaces uh, in its equilibrium state, in some parts it's in, it retains, it managed to retain an out of equilibrium distribution. That's, uh, that's the idea, okay? 
So, uh, if you just happen to draw what would be the last scattering surface, then this bumpy landscape, if you just take the cross section, would look like this. Okay? This would be remnants, this, uh, this would be parts where the field retains, if you tune parameters appropriately, where the field retains the out of equilibrium distribution or the out of equilibrium initial value or close to it. So, obviously, some of these patches are going to intersect the last scattering surface, some others will not. Okay? And, uh, well, small scale patches it will intersect the last scattering surface less frequently because they are smaller, but they're more abundant. So they have uh, a fair chance of intersecting. But large scale patches are less abundant, but because they're larger, they have a greater chance of interacting, uh, of intersecting. So it doesn't, if you tune parameters just a little bit, not much, it's not difficult to get to obtain one of these slices, okay? And, uh, well, you might think that this is uh, big enough, this is a cartoon, okay? So, you might think that this is big enough to become, if for some reason the field configuration affects the curvature perturbation by whatever mechanism, you might think that this could be a seed for the cold spot, because, uh, you know, if uh, there is a large chunk of the cosmic macro, uh, well, of the last scattering surface that has something on it, okay? So, but this is just the presentation of the idea. So, getting down to business, how do you do this? Because it's uh, nice to produce the idea, but you have to specify what's the model and so on. So, well, we are going to begin with, like I said, an inflaton who is not over there, it's not in this part of, in this Lagrangian. The inflaton is something that, that occurs at the background and uh, for the time being, I, like I said, it's not written there. It will become later, okay? But for the time being, it's just not there. I'm just considering the isocavity field, sigma field, another field chi, I have to add another field chi, to interact with it, with the renormalizable interaction, and that will be it, okay? Just one scalar, two scalar fields interacting, two massive scalar fields interacting through this uh, renormalizable um, interaction. Uh, I'll come to that later. I'll come to that later. Uh, in principle, the chi field needs not to be coupled to the inflaton. The sigma field, we'll see that, yes, uh, it can be coupled to the inflaton. Okay? So, um, so, this is the system, and these are the initial conditions that I'm going to consider. So, I'm going to consider that the sigma field, okay, is, uh, its mass is dominated by the Hubble induced correction, and I'm going to require that this is not much smaller than unity. So I'm going to ask, I'm just going to put the genetic prediction of supergravity, that in absence of tuning, okay, this uh, sigma, this C sigma is of order one. And the same goes for the other field, okay, for the field chi. So I'm going to ask again, uh, sorry, I'm going to, to require this initial condition that the field sigma begins in a state, the expectation value for the for the sigma field is such that the effective mass for the chi field is much larger, so much larger than the Hubble scale. Okay, so that the chi field begins as a heavy field. Here is the problem. This seemingly unnatural, uh, this is a very seemingly unnatural condition. If you put these fields in the sitter space and you allow slow roll inflation to happen, you will never get to satisfy this constraint. Okay, but for the time being, let me no, yes. I, I don't agree this is unnatural. These are supersymmetric flat directions. Right? Yes. So they are mutually exclusive. You want supersymmetric flat directions. These are flat line. One de develops and it gives mass to the other, which don't develop. Yeah, but they couple. Yeah, they, they, they would be coupled, right? Even supersymmetric flat directions. So that's why you cannot excite all of them. But yeah, but. So this seems to me not unnatural. No, it is. It is. It is unnatural because the flat directions are coupled, so this flat direction, this flat direction is providing an effective mass. To the other. Yes. So only one develops and the other cannot develop. Yeah, okay. But uh, the point is that, uh, okay, in, in the sitter space you have uh, an equilibrium value, okay, for the fluctuations of the, of the sigma right. field. It and may, It may happen that one is a slightly lighter, takes over, and yeah, but, but you have to, yeah, in that case, you have to take C sigma very small. 
small, much smaller than one. I'm trying to defend your mechanism. I think that yeah, it is. It's not, it's not so bad. No, no, but. Okay. Okay. But then you would like this. You see, you would like this to be g, the coupling constant, smaller than one, or at most a further one. So yeah, you cannot satisfy this condition unless c sigma is very small, and you are in slow roll, and the fluctuation and uh, the typical fluctuation for sigma square is uh, you know or for the h square over the mass. So yeah, this is not natural. This is actually not natural. But for the time being, let me just assume it because I'm going to justify it fully afterwards. So. Uh, there are two, well, the, the issue of couple flat directions we studied here in this paper. So this is where all this is coming from. This is uh, the very seed of all this work. So we discovered here that there are two, well, we discovered, we found out, we, we understood that there are two dynamical regimes, one in which uh, uh, the initial expectation value, because uh, this initial expectation value is making the chi field heavy, then you can integrate it out, you can produce an effective potential for the sigma field, and then sigma evolves pretty much as a free field. Okay, there is the other regime in which, because sigma is evolving in a nearly quadratic potential, okay, then, uh, well, maybe I'll explain that later, maybe not. Uh, <laughs> uh, because sigma is evolving in a quadratic potential, remember it's dominated by the, the mass is uh, determined by the Hubble induced correction, okay, so the sigma field decreases. And as it decreases, then this condition will at some point be satisfied if time allows to, uh, if inflation is long lasting enough or, or uh, well, if you arrange parameters in such a way, this condition can be satisfied. In that case, the, massive, uh, the mass of the chi field ceases to be heavy. And ceasing to be heavy in an inflationary background means that the chi field is going to undergo particle production, okay? So this is similar to the trapping mechanism that um, written by Kaufman and, and colleagues, but um, you know, Kaufman and, and colleagues did not this uh, during inflation. Uh, there are many other papers doing this uh, sort of trapping mechanism during inflation in Kaufman and, uh, and et al. This wasn't the case, but uh, basically the, the idea is basically the same. Because of this interaction and because of the production of super horizon perturbations, then there is an interaction and the sigma field you know, becomes, uh, becomes a heavy field, is trapped at the, uh, towards the origin, at the origin, and uh, the expectation value is exponentially suppressed. Okay? That's how it goes. So, we then have the emergence of a patchy structure. Okay? This is the paper of the, of the cold spot. And um, the patchy structure can be schematically summarized as follows. Where sigma retains a large out of equilibrium expectation value, then uh, you have this out of equilibrium, okay, so to speak, this out of equilibrium value, I don't specify, it, just uh, schematically I can write it like this, okay, this out of equilibrium, if the sigma field performs quasi free fluctuations, meaning that we have not reached this regime in this part of the universe, in the part of the universe where the field is not trapped, then you're over here, okay, in some other parts of the field, uh, of the universe, the sigma field will get trapped, will become trapped, and then uh, the expectation value of the, uh, of the sigma field starts decreasing exponentially because it's a heavy field during inflation. Okay? But, um, well, schematically this is okay. This, uh, there's nothing wrong with this. This is a very rough description. So to make a more precise statement, or to make a more precise uh, analysis, you need to uh, describe from the stochastic point of view all these uh, this patch structure that emerges. So, bit by bit, let me just go through the, through the two regimes. This is the, the regime in which the, say, the sigma field is large, so the chi field can be integrated out. Okay? Then in that case, the sigma field uh, is able to fluctuate, and the evolution of the probability distribution is determined by this Fokker-Planck equation. Okay? This, is, uh, this is very well known. So, the, imagine that the, when Cosmological scales are exiting the horizon, okay, which is this T star. This T star is uh, what stands for. Cosmological scales are exiting the horizon. This is the field configuration. It's very sharply peaked around this expectation value. Okay, and for some reason, mysterious reason, is excited before, uh, well, before, before cosmological scales exit the horizon. Okay? As inflation unfolds, the width of the distribution grows. 
that's particle production mechanism, inflationary particle production does that, the width of the distribution grows, and at some point you reach a state in which you have reached a certain width, and the distribution looks like this, okay, carrying correlations, this is important now, this distribution is carrying all the information on correlations of the sigma field on all scales that are super horizon at, uh, at this time. Okay, it, it carries no other correlations. If you're just looking for correlations on certain scales, then this is the distribution that has all these correlations. If you allow this uh, distribution to evolve, okay, then you will be imprinting structure on even smaller scales, right? But for some reason, well, for some reason, imagine that we want just to trace just the correlations because this, well, this uh, I'm thinking of the correlations on CMB scales. So in my mind, this is the distribution, the field distribution, where you can find correlations for the field on CMB scales. Okay, TK is the moment when the last cosmological scale that you can probe in the CMB exits the horizon. So this, uh, from now on, this is uh, I'm going to deal with the distribution that carries all the information on correlations on CMB scales, right? So how do I do that? Because if I continue with this stochastic formalism, which is well known, I'll be imprinting structure on smaller scales. I will be dealing with a completely different uh, distribution. So the solution, well, one solution, one possibility, uh, which is the, the simplest, of course, is just that you introduce a cutoff in the diffusive term. The diffusive term is just the one that is uh, responsible for the imprint of structure. So you just cut it off. Why? Because, well, because you're just interested in the structure, the field configuration, the classical field configuration, carrying correlations on CMB scales. The other scales not imprinted in the CMB, I don't give a damn about them. So that's what I'm doing. I'm just cutting off the diffusive term, okay, after cosmological scales or after CMB scales, all of them have exited the horizon. And later times, okay, P, this distribution, carries all the structure imprinted on those moving scales. So we have two regimes of evolution. Before, while, uh, first, this, uh, this um, regime is while you have structure being imprinted in the CMB, uh, sorry, in the field configuration on CMB scales, which is the usual stochastic formalism, which you have uh, drift motion and diffusive motion. And there is this other regime after cosmological scales exit the horizon, in which you have a purely deterministic evolution of the probability density. Okay? This is just the evolution of the imprinted structure. We're going to consider no more structure. Okay? So there is a perfectly nice solution to this general equation. For a simple massive field, for a massive field, a non-interacting massive field for time being, this, uh, this equation is, uh, is very easy to solve. It's just a Gaussian. Okay? You impose uh, an initial condition which is a delta because uh, your universe begins or emerges from a nearly homogeneous patch, so you are entitled to put as initial condition a delta-like distribution or sort of a delta or a delta. It's not going to make uh, much of a difference. And you just solve the equation and you find that you have a Gaussian. So the peculiar thing is that, well, the mean is, is nothing mysterious, but the peculiar thing is that the width of the distribution depends. <laughs> well, it's not mysterious either. The width of the distribution depends on the scale that you are considering. Okay? The, if you consider um, more scales, Okay, then the distribution, more scales in your configuration, in your classical field configuration, the variance, the width of the field distribution would be different. So this turns out to be crucial. Okay? But still, this is a very simple solution. Now, how does it look like when we have uh, this drift diffusion? Well, this is well known. Uh, when you have drift plus diffusion, then the probability density, assuming it evolves in that direction, just decreases in height and gets wider. Okay, this is a uh, probability has to be conserved, so the area under the curve is always the same, one. And at this point, okay, maybe this one, yeah, here. Well, this line, well, never mind. Uh, at this point, okay, this is the distribution where 
uh, all the CMB scales are imprinted already in the distribution. And from here onwards, if we consider drift and diffusion, the distribution continues decreasing in height and continues, being, uh, continues opening. But if you just consider, you shut down the imprint of structure, and you just consider drift, what happens is exactly the opposite. Then the distribution grows again and squeezes a little bit, depending on how massive the field sigma is. So, yeah, this part of here, the red one, would carry the distribution with correlation uh, with correlations on uh, scales k minus 1 and larger, and this would carry distribution with correlations on all of the super horizon scales. Okay? Good. So, what about the other, uh, the other regime? Well, in the other regime, which will be eventually reached, you have, like I said before, the chi field undergoing particle production, there is an entire trapping mechanism, okay, that basically is triggered by quantum effects because of this interaction. So you have when the, well, uh, well, uh, imagine that this is a sigma rather than a phi, okay? When phi, well, when phi goes to zero, then the chi field becomes massless, okay? Around phi equals zero, this field becomes massless. And uh, the point is that um, if the field phi is closing quickly, then this will induce a non-adiabatic change in the mass of the chi field and that triggers a non-perturbative particle production of the chi field. Okay? So that's basically what happens and something similar, it's, uh, it's what I'm going to consider for, uh, um, for the mechanism, but not exactly this one. This is just to give you an idea of what's going, what goes on when you have a trapping mechanism of two fields that are interacting through this normalization, uh, uh, through this interaction. Basically the field decreases in amplitude once the interaction becomes effective. Okay? So there are also uh, not just, you can consider not just uh, renormalizable operators, you can as well consider non-renormalizable operators like, like these guys did. And the, uh, the trapping mechanism was shown to be operative as well. So, uh, and there are other papers, like I said, in which uh, particle production of this sort is considered during inflation. Okay, there are, uh, the form of the Lagrangian is like this, this is supposed to be in some papers, these papers over here, this field phi is supposed to be the inflaton. So when the inflaton crosses this certain point, certain expectation value, then the chi field becomes massless, and then there is uh, particle production. Okay. So well, this is the literature, but there are the list is long regarding particle production during inflation. So I'm not going to cite uh, many more than this because the list is really long. And this what happens is that it produces modifications. This was considered because it produces modifications to the inflaton perturbation spectrum. So it gives rise to non-Gaussianity, it gives rise to features, to many things. Okay? In my case, in our case, we're not going to consider the inflaton. It's going to be an Isaac curvature field. So in principle, I'm not concerned with the, modi with the modification of the inflaton perturbation spectrum. Okay? The inflaton perturbation spectrum is going to be uh, untouched. So, the setting is that for some reason you begin in a quadratic potential, okay, which is determined by the Hubble induced correction, and you have the field, it, it begins the phase of slow roll. Let me uh, say, introduce this new value, okay, I have introduced this one earlier, but now I'm going to introduce this value. The value where the field starts slow roll, starts to slow roll. It doesn't have to start to slow roll over here. It may have started to slow roll earlier. So this may be the field. Uh, this is the field value when it uh, slow roll begins. As the field relaxes towards the zero, it crosses uh, the point sigma star where cosmological scales exit the horizon. And at some point, okay, it's, uh, the interaction becomes effective over here when the sigma value, the expectation value of the sigma field is of this order. Okay? Over here, the interaction would be efficient, would produce chi particles. Those, that part of the universe in which the interaction is effective would be, be, would be driven towards uh, small values of the field. And those part of the universe in which the field is not trapped because of the interaction, the interaction is still uh, inefficient, would be over here. 
So you have uh, an out of equilibrium configuration. Imagine this is uh, the state at the end of inflation. You have part of the distribution over here and some other part of the distribution down there. And this would correspond then to the out of equilibrium phase. Okay, you begin with an out of, with an out of equilibrium value and at the end of inflation, if you tune parameters properly, you just retain some part. The remainder, okay, went to the, to, the, to the equilibrium phase. And like I said, the point is that uh, to identify this uh, out of equilibrium phase with the out of equilibrium patches over here, so that uh, you can produce, if you provide the appropriate mechanism, you can modify the curvature perturbation imprinted on the CMB. And this phase over here would be uh, where, there is no, uh, where there is no fill over there, the white parts, okay? Good, so now we have, because we have two regimes of evolution, then, okay, you can impose, uh, well, the point is how do you describe this transition? Because obviously you need to describe this transition if you want to come up with a, a structure or, or a patchy structure or you want to describe stochastically the patches that are out of equilibrium, then you have to describe this transition over here from the out of equilibrium to the equilibrium phase. The simplest, the simplest is just consider uh, boundary conditions which are called absorbing, uh, absorbing barrier boundary conditions in which the field distribution, the, uh, the probability density just goes to zero. So this is basically that the, the, parts, the parts of the field that reach this barrier are automatically extracted from the system. This would be uh, the image, okay? So these are absorbing barrier boundary conditions. And in the, cost, uh, in the context of uh, inflation, we're considering in 2010, uh, in the context of this geometric uh, DBI inflation, and then uh, to consider, uh, and then in a later paper, to consider um, well, the evolution, the stochastic evolution of flat direction, of flat, uh, couple flat directions. So, if the field distribution touches the barrier, when you have over here a second order differential equation, meaning a Fokker-Planck equation, then the solution is going to be over here, is going to be very difficult to describe in simple analytical terms. It's going to be quite complicated, okay? It can be done, it's uh, not very complicated, but the solution is very difficult to work with. You just uh, try an eigenfunction expansion, you're done. But like I said, that's very difficult to, to work with if you want to do computations. So what, sort of what the method of MH is? Because yes, yes, the, this is, it applies, it applies. And actually in uh, this paper it's explained how you can use the method of images, not for the quadratic potential, because for the quadratic potential it's, it's just a nightmare. It is undoable. In this paper we have a linear potential. In a linear potential it is very simple. But basically, yes, you have an image, okay, because these, uh, these boundary conditions, what it induces is just um, a reflected wave, so to speak, which travels with a negative probability, of course it's unphysical, but when you compose the signal with the reflected image, then you have the total signal. So yes, this is, a, like I said, for a linear potential is doable and is very simple, is beautiful. For, uh, for a massive field, for a quadratic uh, potential, it's just a nightmare. So, but we then have the other situation in which maybe the field distribution reaches the barrier, the absorbing barrier, when uh, all the structure has already, all the CMB structure has already been imprinted in the field configuration. And in that case, you get rid of this term because the uh, theta goes to zero, okay? You have just to shut down the diffusion coefficient. And in that case, the solution is trivial to describe. It's very, it's very simple. You have a Gaussian just traveling towards the left, and it's literally engulfed by the barrier. It's undistorted. It goes undistorted. You may think that, OK, this goes undistorted. It's pretty much undistorted. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't you know, twist, like in here. But in this picture, I have not taken this diffusive term to zero. It's very small compared to the previous case. It's just not zero, it's just very small compared to the previous case, okay? And you can see that, well, still, you have something that, uh, that resembles that uh, a traveling wave that is engulfed and disturbed. 
that is engulfed undisturbed by the absorbing barrier. Okay? So the, the point is that if you consider the diffusion coefficient very small, then the reflected wave that goes, uh, it uh, basically lives very close by to this, uh, to this part, to the barrier. So that's what happens when you uh, take the diffusion coefficient to zero. The reflected wave lives just very close by to the barrier. So you see just a minute, a very minute distortion. Actually, if I magnify this plot, you can see just a distortion over there. But because this is very small, it's basically transparent. And this is very, very simple to describe for a, for a massive field. This is just straightforward. So you are faced with this question, what do I use? Do I use the simple solution? Do I use the complicated solution? Which is best? And fortunately enough, fortunately enough, in the cases where you don't tune your potential, okay, when you have C sigma <coughs> and C chi of order one, then the solution that applies is the simple one. And this is very easy to understand that the solution, the good solution is the, uh, the simple one. Why? Well, if you have a quadratic potential uh, and the field starts at some point, 90 foldings afterwards, all the cosmological scales have exited the horizon, okay? And, but still you have some 50 foldings for the distribution to evolve. So, if by the end of the first 90 foldings, when you have all the structure imprinted, the distribution is close to the barrier, and you still wait 50 foldings for inflation to finish, then the distribution is totally gone. So if you are to obtain a patchy structure, then the solution that you have to use is this one, the simple one. We're just fortunate, but this happens to be the case. So this is the simple solution that we are entitled to use. Uh, well, you can produce, like I said before, a Gaussian. You can take it towards the end of inflation. You have a prediction for the width, okay? And you have this very simple solution predicted from particle physics parameters. This, uh, this number, this is the multiplicity of the chi field. At this point, it doesn't appear in, uh, it plays no role in this approximation, but it will play a role afterwards. And um, also you have primary inflation parameters, okay? Basically, the value that you have to justify for the, for, the field, uh, for the field sigma at the um, at horizon crossing, which depends on the number of E-foldings of primordial inflation and the expansion history during, primordial, uh, during primary inflation. The primary inflation is uh, just the part of inflation that happens before cosmological scales exit the horizon. Okay? So, yeah, this is the part of the inflation that we, we don't have access to. Good. <coughs> so, once you have this solution, okay, you can compute the fraction of the inflated volume where you have out of equilibrium correlations on CMB scales. If you have these correlations on CMB scales, you just need to, uh, to compute the probability of interaction of, a, of one of these patches with a large scattering surface, and you can compute the fraction of, uh, well, uh, at the end, you can compute uh, the expected number density of patches with correlations on CMB scales okay, in the CMB, and there are intersecting. And this is a geometric factor that you have to compute, but it is very, very simple to compute. I'm not going to explain how this is computed. It is simple enough. Okay? So at the end of the day, what you have is that this fraction, if you derivate with respect to wave number, then it allows you to compute the number density of out of equilibrium patches, let's call them like this, on a given scale, okay, on a given commoving scale. So, knowing now that you have, uh, well, the number of patches in the CMB on a certain scale, then what you compute is the relative number of out of equilibrium patches to the number of patches in that same scale on the CMB. And you can plot this, uh, this ratio, okay? And this is how it goes. Of course, parameters were tuned here so that you have a number of, uh, of order one, okay, for scales corresponding roughly to the cold spot. Obviously, I wanted to explain the cold spot, so I tune parameters, okay, so that there is a number of uh, patches, number density of patches of order one, out of equilibrium patches of order one, in scales corresponding to the cold spot, okay? But there are also some interesting things over here, and it's that even though this is a preferred scale, it seems to be a preferred scale, 
okay? Because uh, if you count the relative number of patches, out of equilibrium patches to patches in the CMB in that scale, well, this ratio peaks over here, okay? But the number of patches in smaller, in smaller scales, the relative number is decreasing, but the number is growing, okay? So you would be found, you, you would be finding large, large numbers of uh, out of equilibrium patches on smaller scales, although the relative number of those patches compared to the number of patches in the CMB would be decreasing, okay? Good. So, um, this is basically describes the, the distribution of out of equilibrium patches in a very rough approximation, okay? In a very rough approximation. So, there are some concerns before moving on. For example, the first one, like the probability density distribution is not properly account, accounted for if I consider boundary conditions like this. The problem is that this basically amounts to an instantaneous transition from the out of equilibrium phase to the equilibrium phase. Is this, uh, how wrong is this? Well, this is, well, this is uh, wrong. Why this is wrong? Well, because the relaxation, the transition to the equilibrium phase requires interaction with the superhorizon fluctuations of the chi field. And those superhorizon fluctuations are produced during inflation over the Hubble time scale. So that's precisely the point. This cannot be an accurate description because the relaxation time has the Hubble time scale, operates on the Hubble time scale, because it goes on particle production that occurs over the Hubble time scale. So, this probability going to exactly zero has nothing to do with, uh, it's unable to describe the transition to the relaxed phase. Solution? Well, do the computation. So, what, <laughs> what I'm doing just is solving this interaction system. Okay, I'm just going to solve this numerically. I have the interaction Lagrangian, I have a classical field configuration, Hubble-induced correction, the mass induced by the interaction of the field, then we have the fluctuations of the chi field and the mode equation, which is basically the sum of the amplitude of the modes, and we have the mode equation for the perturbation modes of the chi field. You solve this for a number of E-foldings, not many because numerical solutions don't allow you, if you want to perform them with certain confidence, don't allow you to include 1,000 E-foldings. This is just uh, for a few E-foldings. Um, well, but you can do it. And the solution is that uh, I'm plotting here the solution. Okay, this is the sigma field, and this is the number of E-foldings, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, until 7, okay, over which the trapping mechanism operates. So 3 is the point where the barrier is located, and once the field makes it the barrier, Okay, it can uh, well relax, it relaxes in this way. And this is, uh, like I said, this is, we have tried and we have checked that these curves solve numerically very well to very good precision, to very good accuracy, this couple system. So I'm not making this up. This is just the, the numerical solution of this system. This curve over here is for uh, um, a number of fields, n chi, the multiplicity of the chi field would be of order 200. If you consider a multiplicity of the chi field of order 400, this would be the curve, or 100, 200, 400. I can't remember exactly the names, but, but this is it, of order 100. And if you consider fields in the order of the 100, then you have a relaxation, which is of order the Hubble time scale. This is it. Sorry, um, maybe you mentioned it. How large is G? Well, I'm taking it, uh, well, it, yeah, I didn't mention it. It's, it's a further one. Okay. But uh, you can rescale things yeah. and the solution would still have this appearance. Yeah, but um, I guess things would rescale also. Yes. The that of those as yes, yes. Uh, this would be rather than sigma, that would be sigma over GH. Yeah, exactly. So, now that you have uh, these, uh, these dynamics, you can actually describe how the probability density transits makes its way to its equilibrium to the to the relaxation phase and that's what i'm going to show okay this is in the e folding 50, uh, 45 and what i consider initially at the e folding zero is a gaussian distribution okay whose width 
is the width, the inflationary prediction after 90 foldings. So basically, this is the uh, distribution that, uh, that is evolved, okay? but the, the initial distribution is the one carrying the correlations on CMB scales. So after 45 E foldings, you have this one. Okay? You move on, okay? E folding 50, and here is the barrier. It touches the barrier over there. Okay? So you continue, and you see that the distribution starts to leak towards the equilibrium phase. Another E fold, there is more leaking to the equilibrium phase. There are less population over here, and this continues on and on and on until the equilibrium phase starts populating seriously, but when the equilibrium phase populates seriously, okay, because there are great deal of uh, substantial, very substantial part, or most of the part of the inflated volume is in the equilibrium phase, you still have some population over there. So here are the remnants. You have the remnants over here. These are the remnants. And all of these appear in the CMB, because this is the distribution that carries uh, correlations on CMB scales. So you have a relaxed phase, which is most of the CMB, and you have an out of equilibrium phase, which is just a remnant. This is it. So, well, and then the whole thing continues, and so on and so on. A different thing that you can try, which is simpler, is just try a phenomenological approach. If you want to spare all this job, you don't want to do this job, you're lazy. So you just propose something phenomenological, and you just consider a, trans a relaxation time scale of order the Hubble time, and that's it. You could do with that, just uh, without solving all this problem. Okay? Uh, these I'll be using later on. So, sorry, I'm maybe to show you that I didn't understand that thing, but you are having an event of particle production that is opening your distribution mm -hmm. and then you are re relaxing towards the minimum of the potential for sigma. Yes. And what I am understand, uh, that the thing that is confusing for me is that how comes this very broad distribution as you get to the minimum collapses so quickly towards a very narrow one and it doesn't just oscillate about the minimum and get in narrow. Uh, it does oscillate. One over R, one over N. Because it's not showing resolution. Yes, uh, if I show you this in logarithmic scale, you would see it more clearly. I see. So, so, okay. but, so but yes, it's oscillating. That you, that you showed, okay. Yes, that yes. The choice of snapshots. Yeah, exactly, okay. exactly. But the field is oscillating. Actually, the oscillations. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the oscillation is not was not as much my is there. As, it, as it was. Yeah. The oscillations are there. If I show you the logarithmic scale yeah. plot, you would see all of the oscillations yeah. over there. So the, the oscillation was not as much my concern as it was the fact that you had this distribution that stayed very flat and then was, you know, if you go ahead a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, that is going up? Yeah, yeah it, it, it's, you know, it has this L shape. No, th this is great. Towards the end? Yeah, but towards the end, yeah. Over there? Yeah, this, is, this, is, this was confusing for me. That you had Why? This, because it's too sharp. It's it's both too shallow and too sharp and too yeah too sharp. You know it's both too shallow on one side and too steep on the other side. And I would have expected if, if this comes from any evolution of the you know what was effectively a Gaussian distribution. Yes. It will stay more or less Gaussian. Yeah. Well, but uh, then uh, the point is that because you have. Uh, a distribution that is, uh, you know, it's got a width, yeah. and all of the distribution is going through the interaction point at the same time. Yeah. So some parts of the, of the distribution yeah. enter the interaction later. Yeah, sure. So what you see over here is that, uh, well, you have to yeah, take yeah, into yeah, account yeah, that yeah, this is see, one, yeah, two yeah. foldings, and the field from here onwards is massive, so the amplitude of the expectation value decreases exponentially with yeah. the number of E foldings, so okay. this accumulates very quickly over there. Okay. So like I said, if I, if I show you the plot in logarithmic scale, mm -hmm. you would see how smaller uh, values, 10 to the minus 1, 10 to the minus yeah, 2, yeah. are being populated, okay. and are being populated uh, you know, in order, obviously. Okay. So, um, uh, like I said, you can try a phenomenological approach if you want to not to do this computation. And these are the big question. This is the big question, naturalness. How natural is this? Because you have to catch the field configuration halfway towards the equilibrium value. You have to tune the parameters good enough so that you still have some remnants, but you still have uh, the most of the distribution in the, in the, in the relaxed phase. 
So, a number of considerations. First, and this is considered to be a safe assumption, basically, inflation begins in some sort of non-slow roll phase. If inflation begins, if inflation exists, which I believe, or I want to believe, for sure, I believe most of us are convinced that it's not beginning in slow roll. So there must be some deviation from slow roll. I call this genetically non-slow roll phase of inflation. And possibly close to the Planck scale, who knows, maybe not. But uh, there's going to be a non-slow roll phase. This is a <coughs> sort of a safe assumption, okay? What happens is that the last n star falls, 50, 60 foldings, happen at a very much lower scale and in a slow roll phase. So this is the observable part, slow roll inflation for 60 e folds, no problem with that. But the primary phase, where inflation begins, like I said, encompasses a phase of non-slow roll and maybe some phase of slow roll as well. This is 60, this might be this non-slow roll phase which is uh, out of your sight. You don't have access to the scales that exited during this, uh, um, during this phase. This might be some 10 E foldings, 20 E foldings, who knows? Okay, it need not to be zero. So you have non-slow roll, then slow roll maybe, and then the 60 E foldings that we know, we all know work so well. And that's the first consideration, okay? That uh, you might have some primary inflation with non-trivial dynamics. Then, my guess, well, my guess, another assumption is that inflation is going to last around 100 E foldings. If there is no shift symmetry and you have to tune the supergravity potential, okay, for sure you have to tune it to get 60 e foldings because these are the observable part of inflation. So the minimal tuning, the minimal additional tuning, okay, is requiring, if forces you to require that inflation does not last much longer than 60 e foldings. Okay, because if you require inflation to last for thousands of e-foldings, then you would have to find considerably more the, uh, the potential. So this is sort of the minimal tuning, assuming that inflation just lasts for 100 e-foldings or so, okay, order of magnitudes. Because, like I said, a larger number of e-folds implies a larger tuning. I'm going also to consider Hubble-induced correction. And this I said before, C sigma for the one, which is sort of genetic, less tuned than the inflaton, which has to be smaller, but still you have to allow some tuning for this to be compatible with particle production because otherwise uh, the distribution of the sigma field is going to be very sharp, and if it's very sharp, okay, then um, what happens is that uh, uh, there is no patchy distribution, there is no patchy structure, okay? It all goes, to through, it all goes through the interaction point at the same time, so there is no there are no patches. It's got to have some width, and that's why you have to allow some particle production. Okay? And finally, relaxation time scale to impose of order, uh, well, number of EFOLs uh, during inflation, but depends on the initial condition. Okay? On the initial condition that I'm going to explain in a minute how to generate it. So, too large or too small expectation value at the beginning of. Uh, for the sigma field at the beginning of inflation leads to an absence of structure, the structure that you are after. Okay? So the condition to have this patch structure, the naturalness condition, the very enforcing one, is basically that, ah, no, <laughs> never mind. I'm going to, before I move into that, I'm going to explain to you very quickly, because my time is running out, uh, I'm going to explain to you how to generate this initial condition. Okay, I'm going to explain this. This is very simple. Even though the like, initial condition is unnatural, I'm just going to explain how it's done. And it's very simple. It's uh, disturbingly simple. So imagine that you have uh, a variation of uh, epsilon, a constant, uh, uh, well, uh, phase of inflation in which the epsilon parameter is constant. Need not to be small, because we're going to consider non-slow roll. Okay? So epsilon could be of order one, smaller than one, obviously, because you still need inflation. Um, so you need, you need the, um, to produce inflation so the epsilon is uh, less than one, but constant. Okay, this is the, just the simplest you can think of. And the simplest that possibly you can solve analytically. Okay, the Hubble parameter, if this is 
the epsilon parameter for the uh, the epsilon parameter this solves uh, the background uh, the background dynamics okay so you have this is for inflation and now you have your isocurvature field okay so you introduce the background over here and compute the solution okay if you allow epsilon to go to zero then you are in slow roll inflation and you recover the usual solution in slow roll inflation this is uh, very well known but I'm not going to allow epsilon to go to zero because I want to consider just some early stage of inflation of primary inflation in which we generically expect to have non-slow roll so I cannot just take this to zero okay in the super horizon regime when modes exit the horizon then the amplitude of the perturbation modes with respect to age scale like this so this grows provided this is uh, larger than zero which means the knee parameter is going to be larger than three halves this is just it's very easy to do this is uh, you can do it exactly this is, there is no approximation involved here okay so if you plot the c sigma parameter basically the mass of the sigma field and here you plot the epsilon parameter this is the region where you have the modes the amplitude of the uh, modes for the sigma field going uh, growing above the hubble scale in all this part over here you just have to consider an epsilon which is not too close to zero okay so what happens really is that the rapid decrease of the hubble parameter because you're considering an epsilon of order one the rapid decrease of the Hubble parameter implies the following the time scale for H to fall is smaller than the time scale for Sigma to fall so if you arrange this uh, any point over here then the background is going to decrease faster than the expectation value of the field in relative terms what you what you have is that the field is growing although th both the field and the Hubble parameter are decreasing because that's what they do in relative terms sigma field is growing above the Hubble parameter that's what happens that's just that or simply that they, you can also take the view that the effective mass square of sigma becomes negative and you have just tachyonic instability sigma grows this is what happens but you don't have tachyonic instability you just have a rapidly shifting background that's it okay so uh, evolution of the width la 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 I'm just uh, how much do I have 15 minutes okay I'm doing well so in this regime okay this is the evolution of the width you can because you can compute the perturbation mode then you can compute the evolution of the width okay so you can see the evolution with the number of heat foldings of non-slow roll which is what I'm putting here non-slow roll number of heat foldings and this grows provided the the um, this condition knee is larger than three halves this grows with the number of e foldings so for zero e foldings i'm considering a sharply peaked distribution around zero five ten fifteen e foldings afterwards you have this distribution for five e foldings after 15 e foldings after or 10 15 15 e foldings after the beginning okay so the field values under the curve okay are those becoming likely so larger values of sigma over h are becoming likely at the beginning to just have sigma over h very close to zero so very small values of sigma compared to h and as non-roll non-slow roll inflation elapses then larger values are still allow are allowed this is what doesn't happen during slow roll inflation and this is why it's important to consider non-slow roll inflation because generically you can amplify fields over their equilibrium value in the sitter space so that's the point these phases which are genetically expected what can they, what can they do for you well they can amplify over the hubble scale over the equilibrium value in the sitter space uh, the expectation value of fields that are that, that are able to fluctuate uh, during inflation so the initial condition is justified provided the width of the distribution is larger than the value that you consider at the beginning of the slow roll okay which requires enough inflation with sufficiently large epsilon but remember that too large or too small a sigma 
uh, sigma value, an expectation value at the beginning of the slow roll, gives absence of a patchy structure. So you have to be just right. You have to just order that the expectation value of the field at the beginning of the slow roll, however it lasts, if it lasts 100, 100, 200, 200, the expectation value to have a patchy structure has to be of order of the width of the field at the end of the non-slow roll phase. That's how you link non-slow roll with the slow roll if you want to produce a patchy structure. Okay? So this is the condition. Okay? And it's clear that if you ask, if you put a very large value of uh, the initial value, maybe at the end of inflation you will be over here and there is no patchy structure because everything, the distribution is in the out of equilibrium state. And if you put, if you take a very small value of uh, sigma SR at the beginning of the slow roll, maybe by the end of inflation all of the distribution will be here and there is no patchy structure. Okay? So you can plot this, uh, this constraint very easily. This plot you can constrain it straightforward. This is it. Imagine that you consider just a number of slow roll E foldings, just the necessary amount of slow roll E foldings. Okay? Then here in this vertical axis we have the non-slow roll. Okay? So this is for 60 E-foldings, this is for a number of slow roll E-foldings of order 100, and this is for 200, okay? So if you just consider 10 to the minus 1, logarithm, uh, well, C5 of order 10 to the minus 1, you see that even with 60 or 100 E-foldings of slow roll is enough to require 25 E-folds, around 25 E-folds or 20, of a non-slow roll. So you have to provide a mechanism, an inflationary mechanism, able to give you some 20, 25 uh, e-foldings of non-slow roll, and then after either 60 or 100 e-foldings of slow roll inflation, you're going to find a patch structure of the isocurvature field. Uh, this is uh, the same, uh, well, basically for different values of the epsilon parameter, but there is something interesting here. And it's the following. Imagine that you are over here with uh, C5 of order 10 to the minus 1. Then, like I said, uh, over here you have intersection of these two, so you would need some 25 V foldings. Okay? So if you want the field configuration to extend for 200 E foldings or something like this for a considerably larger phase of slow roll, then you have to include a considerably larger non-slow roll phase. Okay? So you are driven in the lack of fine tuning, in the absence of fine tuning, you are just driven to these values, okay, of order 20. And you can, you can hold the out of equilibrium configuration not just for 60 EFOS, but for maybe 100 close to, not necessarily just 60 or 62, but uh, maybe 100, okay? So, if anomalies have a primordial origin, then short-lived inflation seems to be a feature that emerges over here. And uh, the other feature is that non-slow roll, uh, you require a non-slow roll phase well before the largest cosmological scales exit the horizon. Okay? This is what seems to uh, follow from the, from, the, from the scenario that I'm considering. So maybe CMB anomalies uh, can be used as a tool to discriminate models of inflation because uh, the model of inflation that you need to consider has to have this, uh, has to give you this number of slow roll foldings or non slow roll foldings. Okay, this is necessary. So, well, this is the explanation. I'm not going to explain the cold spot, it's lack of time. So, the paper is already published. If you're interested, please go ahead and uh, just uh, I'm going to skip this. But uh, answering your question, Patrick, uh, this is where you couple the sigma field to the inflaton. To produce a cold spot, I'm using a version, a local version of the inhomogeneous reheating scenario. So you have to couple the sigma field, you have to couple it to the inflaton. This is the mechanism that you use, one of the possible mechanisms that you use okay, to produce a cold spot. You have this out of equilibrium patch, and if you modify the decay rate of the, of the inflaton field in this patch because of this coupling, then you can produce something like the cold spot. Okay, like I said, I have uh, no time to say anything more uh, in this bit. You can go to the, to the paper, it's already published and, uh, well, sorry. Um, I'm not going to talk about this either. Again, it's the same. Power deficit, it's under construction. So let me just uh, make it to the local breaking of statistical isotropy, which is uh, an interesting part, I think. 
So, <coughs> vectors, globally very much constrained in the CMB through this anisotropy parameter, okay? You have the curvature perturbation spectrum, you have an isotropic part, and one way of constraining the anisotropy the anisotropy, the level of anisotropy is through this G anisotropy parameter, which it happens to be very small. Okay? But you, that tells you that it's very small. That tells you that the field in the entire CMB, okay, in the entire last scattering surface, the presence of the vector field in the entire CMB is very much constrained. But this is not telling you how constrained the vector field is if you just happen to find it in some patches of the CMB. Okay, so this allows you to evade this local uh, patchy structure would allow you to evade this bound because this bound is for a vector imprinting a perturbation in the entire large scale, uh, sorry, in the, li in the entire uh, large scattering surface, in the entire CMB. You do this now by patches. So you're not constrained, you're not bound by this. Okay, so you can relax this bound and you can make the vector field compatible, maybe. The question is, how are we just, from a scalar field, how are we going to produce a vector field perturbation over here? What's the mechanism? For the cold spot, I have the inhomogeneous reheating. For the vector field, what can I find? And uh, you're going to find, uh, maybe you are all familiar with this by now. So this is the mechanism that allows you to do so. So just take the sigma field, which was obtaining a patch structure, you get it to modulate the kinetic function of a vector field. You have a perfectly healthy, massive vector field with a kinetic function, okay? So just put the scalar field that obtains this patch structure to modulate the kinetic function. This you can do, okay? So you have an out of equilibrium distribution, which would correspond to this part, okay? And you can ask that this is nearly scale invariant. You can arrange things so this is nearly scale invariant over there to the end of inflation. And in the equilibrium phase, okay, you can consider, uh, you can say that this is, uh, the kinetic function goes to one, while this scales as a to the minus four. Uh, this is very easily done if you consider something of a uh, generic, type like this. You consider this very generic form for the kinetic function and when the sigma field goes and starts oscillating around the zero, this goes to one. Okay, so this condition. And when you have some dynamics over here because the field sigma is, is rolling, then you can have, if you tune um, this lambda appropriately, then you have something similar to this. Although you still find some, if you plug in the uh, the numerical solution of the uh, of the couple system, you still can find some departures from scale invariance, which uh, are uh, interesting, maybe interesting to investigate. So, this is not what I'm doing now. Uh, well, this is what I'm doing, but what I, what I mean is, I'm not going to plug the exact solution of the numerical solution. I'm just going to try a phenomenological approach, in which, well, this exponent, this alpha, goes from minus four, which is the scale invariant point to the point zero, which is the end of the scaling, okay? And because I have a distribution with a width, not all of the points, uh, not all the patches in the universe are going to go through the interacting point at the same time. So in some parts, this regime uh, begins earlier. In some other parts, this regime begins later. So there is a delay, okay? So we have here, well, this is the alpha. And uh, you solve the evolution background equation for the vector field, okay? So you just take this phenomenological form of the exponential, construct the kinetic function, just plug the differential equation, solve it numerically, and what comes out of it, of the computer, is something like this, okay? So this black, well, let me explain what this is. The black solid line is just um, reproducing the history of uh, the evolution of a patch in which the field value is the mean of the distribution, okay, it's just the center of the distribution, and this part over here reproduces the evolution of a patch in which the field sigma has a value uh, which is smaller. So it's entering the interaction a bit earlier, and because it enters the interaction a bit earlier, this transition occurs earlier, it makes it earlier to the, uh, to the, o to the end of the scaling, and that's why the energy density is decreasing with some delay, there is some delay. This is the part 
parts of the universe where the sigma field is slightly larger, it enters the interaction slightly later, and because it enters the interaction slightly later, the energy density, well, it's, it's a bit larger, okay? So, in the vector curvaton, this, the curvature perturbation imprinted by the vector field is proportional to the energy density. So you have an energy density over here. If you have the energy density suppressed in certain patches, then uh, the curvature perturbation in equilibrium patches is going to be correspondingly suppressed. So you have the equilibrium, the curvature perturbation in, out, in equilibrium patches is suppressed with respect to the curvature perturbation in out of equilibrium patches. There's an entire computation over here. I'm not going to show the details because my time is over, right? Yeah, three yeah. minutes. <laughs> what? How much? Three minutes. Three minutes over or still to go? I still need to go. Okay. <laughs> so I have, uh, I can show the, the result of the evolution of the, of this, um, the probability density, okay, <laughs> uh, with certain quiet. Okay. So what I'm going to plot basically is the process of the how, uh, uh, beginning from the initial distribution in the field values, okay, from the initial Gaussian, how you're going to get this distribution in the curvature, in the amplitude of the curvature perturbation, okay? So, if you begin, uh, well, if inflation finishes uh, with just one phase, okay, all of the patches in the out of equilibrium phase, then what you're going to see here, uh, let me explain what this is. This is the curvature perturbation in a patch, okay, with respect to the out of equilibrium or the initial curvature perturbation that you will have. So a delta over here means that most of the distribution, uh, most of the distribution is still in the out of equilibrium phase, okay? So, and this is the probability distribution, okay? In the vertical axis. So as uh, the end of inflation is, um, well, as, as you find more patches in the out of or close to the equilibrium phase, this distribution, okay, is uh, becoming populated on larger, on smaller values of the curvature perturbation uh, over the initial value. If there are some more patches in the, uh, if your structure is, uh, contains more patches, then the curvature perturbation over here still is dominant, okay? So that means that the curvature perturbation in uh, most of the CMB is in this part. This is the out of equilibrium already computed uh, um, curvature perturbation, but some parts of the universe, the curvature perturbation, because the energy of the density field is, uh, of the vector field is smaller, that gives correspondingly a curvature perturbation that is smaller, okay? So if you just move on and you continue with the, with the transition, then at some point, okay, the, all the distribution that you had over here starts accumulating around the zero. So what happens in this point is that most of the distribution okay, is in values, uh, or most of the field is in values in which the curvature perturbation is considerably smaller than the curvature perturbation over here by a factor, uh, by a, by a factor of five or something of, uh, of order, uh, of one order of magnitude. So if in those patches that are over here, you set just the amplitude of the curvature perturbation to the observed value, you're just going to observe curvature perturbation in these parts. In the rest of the parts, the curvature perturbation is smaller and you're not going to see the vector field. That's what happens. So, this is basically the final state in which all the distribution starts accumulating in the equilibrium phase. There is absolutely very little in the out of equilibrium phase and the field gets completely relaxed. You never see it. So, the cartoon. The cartoon is that you would end up with a CMB similar to this, in which, in which Okay, the vector field pops out just in some parts of, um, of the CMB because in the rest of the parts of the CMB, okay, the curvature perturbation contributed by the vector field turns out to be smaller than, uh, than the observed one if you tune this to be the observed one. So this is the cartoon that would emerge, okay? This, is, this would be the picture. So how do we find out, because this is complicated, okay? So how do we find out that we have a vector field over there? Well, maybe because vector fields are sources of gravitational waves, 
maybe if you have full sky maps uh, provided by Cori or CMB Paul or Lightbed in the future and you have a sensitivity to measure tensor to scalar ratio for the 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 3, who knows? Maybe you can, uh, you can find correlations between a vector field or what you might suspect that is a vector field and spatial, and spatial variations of the tensor to scalar ratio. That would be a signature. And at the same price, you can also find parity violating signals. So you can do the same trick and just uh, find parity violating signals. So uh, this is the end of my time. Let me just go to conclusions. The wishful thinking, of course, is that the production of these localized perturbations might provide a framework okay, to understand some of the CMB anomalies, provided uh, if they turn out to exist. Okay? Uh, but this requires a slow roll inflation to be not so large, because you cannot, uh, naturally, you cannot require that the vector fields remain excited for ages and ages and thousands of e-foldings. Just you have to have the minimum, um, minimum amount, sort of minimum amount of e-foldings, like 100. Okay, and if you have sort of 100, then it's not too crazy to require that some of the fields that you excited during the non-slow roll phase are going to have, you know, are going to retain an out of equilibrium distribution at the end of inflation. And of course, you have to, uh, given the appropriate tunings, you can find the mechanism for these uh, remnants, for these out of equilibrium remnants, to contribute to the curvature perturbation. Okay? Through, for example, localized versions of the inhomogeneous rigidine, or the vector curvature mechanism, or some other mechanism. Okay? And because vector fields, like I said, are source of a gravitational wave, looking for spatial correlations uh, of R, might reveal the presence of a vector field that is not in the entire CMB but just in certain patches. Okay? So all this is to consider CMB anomalies again as a tool to maybe discriminate models of inflation linking particle physics and, inf and primary inflation. Why? Well, because you have to search for models of inflation compatible with observations. That's easy because there are so many models compatible with observations. But with a naturally built-in relatively long-lasting phases of slow roll. 20 e-folds of slow roll, so pretty much. And uh, my bet is there aren't uh, not many. So this is my, you know, you might have uh, a tool over here just to, to have an idea of what are the models of inflation that might be, you know, favored by if this mechanism turns out to have some chance. So, well, this is uh, all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. <laughs>